All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the first set of functional panels during Google's VetNet Career Week. I'm Will Granis, Managing Director of the Office of the CTO for Google Cloud and a proud US Army veteran. I'm also a proud Army spouse, my wife having served as an airborne Army nurse. Over the next hour, I'll be talking with four amazing Googlers in non-engineering technical roles to discuss their journeys, their recommendations for finding similar roles, and what day-to-day -day life and expectations are like in these functions. Now, these particular roles you hear about are ones that are technical in nature, but not necessarily coding or programming. So no CS degree needed. Fun fact, I lead our advanced technology group for cloud and I don't have a CS degree. So if I can do it and we can do it, so can you. So before we get started, um, there's just one more slight modification I need to make to today's setup. All right, I think that feels a little bit better. I'm surrounded by quite a few uh, Navy folks today. I wanted to make sure I represented uh, appropriately here. Okay, so with that, let's get started. Uh, Erica, Paul, Vincent, and David, I'd love for you to introduce yourself, tell us what team you work on, and at a high level, explain what you do on a daily basis. Erica, over to you. Thanks, Will. Uh, I'm Erica Moreira. I am a proud Navy veteran. And I am a technical program manager in Google Research on the Google Brain team. And more specifically, what I do, I work with the supercomputers that are used for machine learning research. So these are TPUs, tensor processing units. And I do a wide variety of things day to day, which I love. Uh, so some days I'm debugging alongside a researcher. Some days I'm uh, doing more strategic planning for next year and beyond. Um, setting the direction for the team. And some days I'm um, setting up processes and workflows to make things work better for the researchers that are doing this amazing cutting edge research. Awesome, the brains behind brain. Paul, over to you. Yeah, my name is Paul Leckaby. Um, I am a proud Navy veteran. Um, I was an operations specialist in the Navy on the USS Callahan. Um, I am a customer engineer in a, a Google Cloud. Um, so I spend most of my day working with customers, taking their technical requirements and their business requirements and matching those to solutions on GCP to help them make that transformation, you know, from either on-prem or, you know, the clouds to uh, Google Cloud. And I also am in a technical role, but I was, uh, I got a history degree, so, um, as well. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Vincent, over to you. All right, thanks, Will. My name is uh, Vincent D'Angelo, and I'm a Navy veteran, and I work in the technical infrastructure group for data center operations. So my role is as a data center facilities technician. And what we do is we maintain all of the power and cooling infrastructure for Google Cloud's own personally data centers. Well, we appreciate that in cloud, keeping everything up and running. And David, anchor leg, over to you. Awesome. Nice to meet y'all. I'm David. I'm a Salesforce specialist here at Google. Um, I build internal tools using Salesforce for the Play Store. And that might sound boring, but it's actually kind of a dream come true for me because I've always been an outsider when it comes to technology. My degree was in marketing and I always wanted to learn to code, but it just didn't play out like that for me. But uh, because of the Salesforce platform, I could learn to code and you know build tools uh, for Google. And I'm not a veteran, but I'm a big fan, um, which includes helping teach veterans how to code. I've done, for example, multi-month programs, live programs uh, specifically for, for veterans teaching them to code. That's so awesome. Thank you, David. All right, so kind of riffing on that a little bit. Uh, you know, your journey, you're describing a little bit of your journey, David, and kind of how you came to be in a technical role. So let's start with you and we'll roll in reverse order. Um, let's get the origin story. Like, how did you get started in your current role? And uh, what was the path? Like, put us put us in your shoes. Give us a visceral sense of your path. All right, let's see. So I, I started off with a marketing degree. And my first job out of college, I was a professional email spammer, which like literally means I'm setting up emails, spam emails to, you know, tens of thousands of people. And everyone hated me. Like I get back all these emails being like F you like eight pages of it. And it was horrible. It wasn't really how I dreamed my career to be going out of college. Um, so I remember, I remember having this feeling in my heart that I really, really wanted to be involved in tech. I was sitting next to the engineers, 
you know, their job seems so, so interesting. And I eventually came to the conclusion that, you know, I would do whatever it takes to learn to code. And I didn't want to like, you know, look back one day and wish I didn't give it a try just because that was kind of the feeling in my heart at the time. And so I stumbled upon the Salesforce industry, uh, which if you're learning to code is one of the best industries to do so for many reasons, including that it is a lot easier to code in Salesforce than, you know, anything else software engineers at Google do. And so um, I went through the journey of learning to code on Salesforce with help from a lot of people in the Salesforce community, from Salesforce themselves, from events. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of veteran resources in the Salesforce community who will also help you to learn to code. And we can talk more about that later. Um, but yeah, after about six months, I landed my first job as a Salesforce developer writing code you know, for money. And I uh, eventually got a job at Google doing it. And so I've been living this dream not a smart guy, never got good grades, wasn't some kid prodigy, but because of Salesforce and a lot of help from the community, I was able to do it. And I believe anyone can too. Awesome. Thanks, David. Vincent. All right. Thanks, Will. So my journey, you know, I started off, I was uh, a Navy veteran, as I mentioned earlier, I spent uh, quite a while in the Navy and I, you know, operated the nuclear propulsion plants on their ships at sea and on their land-based prototypes. And there was a lot of technical infrastructure that's involved in in those plants that keep those ships up and running. So when I was searching for a career after I was done with my service time, I kind of stumbled upon the fact that Google has some similar infrastructure that it makes their data centers stay up and running. So I was using Google services to kind of search for that career. And I kind of figured out that I can do something like that for that company. And, so I came, came here to Google, and since coming on board to Google, I've been operating their data centers, maintaining and repairing some of the infrastructure there, and I work on a really great team, and uh, we, we enjoy doing what we do every day. Awesome. Thanks, Benson. Uh, Paul? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I had always, I've just always been kind of a geek at heart. Um, so as a kid, I was always into computer. We could never afford computers or anything like that. And, you know, when I was a kid, computers were much more rare. Um, so, you know, it was really only being able to access them through like, at school and stuff like that. So I was always kind of a little bit of a geek. Um, joined the Navy. What I did in Navy, the technology didn't really, doesn't really have a, you know, doesn't really tie into, you know, the public sector. It was all radar systems and weapon systems, which don't really translate to much uh, in, the, in the public sector. But um, when I did get out, I went, you know, to college and, you know, I it was a history major. And back then, colleges didn't have as rigid kind of IT departments, so a lot of people were volunteering to help. So I volunteered to help uh, the, the history department in a lot of their computer systems. I was also part of another organization at school, a volunteer, you know, an organization that was trying to get people more involved in volunteering in the community. So I helped run and set up their computer systems. So I really got into computers in college, but not with a computer degree. I was a history degree, but I volunteered to help with computer systems just because that's what I did. Like in my apartment building in college, I ran a, a computer network for the entire um, apartment building to play video games actually is why I originally set it up um, to do the networking um, um, video games on a LAN. And that's how I got into computer and networking. And then that just kind of through college, you know, I just got more and more experience in that. And then once I got out of college, there was no real history degree, you know, jobs. But there was, I mean, I'm here in the, in the Silicon Valley with lots of jobs for computers. I got a job at a startup. Um, I went into the interview and talked about how I set up a land for my apartment building and stuff like that. And I got a job as a startup. And that's kind of how I got into this industry. Awesome. Uh, gaming was actually an, an origin for me as well in the journey to technology. Yeah. Uh, seeing Pong, <laughs> you want to talk about aging, like uh, Pong, when I saw that for the first time, I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And then Joust was, that sealed the deal for me. I had to get into tech at some point. Yeah. Uh, Erica, over to you. Thanks. Uh, so I've had quite a few zigzags, I would say, in my career journey here. Um, so I started as a Naval Academy student for undergrad, and I was studying systems engineering. Uh, after I graduated, I went on to be a P3 Orion pilot uh, for a couple of years. And then after that, I was convinced that I wanted to go into medicine. So I was looking for anything in the civilian world that would get my foot in the door in the clinical world. And I just stumbled upon this amazing job at Yale University as a programmer analyst helping with medical research. And so that I was there for three years. I loved that job and uh, just really opened my eyes to 
data science and the impact it can have on medicine. Uh, so after that, I decided I wanted to study that further. So I got a master's in health data science. And after that degree, which I also loved, very technical degree, um, but I, I knew that I wanted to find a job that would leverage those technical skills, but also the leadership that I had gained kind of throughout my career, but really from the military. Um, and I learned, I had never heard of TPM, the technical program manager role, but uh, when I learned about it, I was like, that's it. This is the perfect role that kind of melds these two things that I'm looking for. And I've been at Google for a year and a half and really happy here and loving the challenge that Google provides. Awesome. Four very, very interesting paths, all, all varied, uh, but all here at Google. So uh, maybe you had some sense of what you were getting into in your role at Google, but my guess is you didn't, you didn't uh, anticipate all the things that would face you in your day-to-day uh, -day life here. So maybe uh, share with folks that are, um, you know, are watching today, give a peek behind the scenes. Maybe what's the biggest surprise that you've encountered so far uh, in your role? And uh, Vincent, we'll start with you. All right, sure. Well, so, you know, you're right. I knew a little bit about what I was getting into, you know, when I came to Google, but once getting here, I, I was very surprised with how much internally that we really need to help each other out in order to keep all these services up and running. You know, the, the team that I work on is really great and we have a lot of good, good folks, but their network internally that they have, you know, at our other campuses, both around the United States and sometimes even globally, is we really need to help each other out when we're bringing up new systems, part of our expansion, part of repair work. Sometimes we, we just run into roadblocks. And that was really surprising to me how each, in, each individual team would maybe struggle a little bit if they didn't have those networks to reach out to and if they didn't have folks that were willing to, at the drop of a hat, kind of help help uh, their other folks at the other campuses out. So that's probably the biggest thing that was surprising to me, and it's, and it's helped me in numerous ways over the time that I've been here. Paul, how about you? What's, uh, what's most surprising in your current role? Um, <clears throat> I think... Um... I think the surprising thing, I, I think, you know, when we, I think is the perception of Google that everyone has, right? Everyone has a perception of Google as everyone that works at Google has like an IQ of about 700 and is super genius. And how, how did I get this job and how am I going to, how am I going to like, you know, be able to, to be on these teams and stuff. I think I just, that was the biggest surprise that like everyone at Google, I mean, yeah, there's smart people at Google. There's smart people at every job I've ever been at. Um, I think it's just understanding that, Google's just a, just a company. It's a regular company with regular people working at it. Do they do things differently? Yes, I've been working at a lot of companies. I do think Google is different in how they go about things and how we treat, how, how, we, how we think about the things that we do, I think is, is unique in that way for Google. But at the same time, everyone here is just normal people. And, and you know, if you get through the job interview process, or you're just as as capable of doing the job as everyone else you're working with. And, and then just working with everyone, like, you know, kind of like Vincent said, like it, it takes, it takes, you know, not one person is going to fix everything, not one team, you know, just working. And, and I've been really, one of the things I've enjoyed most about that process is working and learning from all my team members is how everyone's willing to kind of just jump in and get things done. But I thought the biggest thing for me was like, Oh, not everyone's a robot here. Not everyone's a super genius. There's just normal people like me working at Google. And I think that was probably the biggest surprise. Eric, Eric I saw you nodding quite a bit uh, <laughs> during the last two descriptions. Uh, anything you wanted to jump in with here? Yeah, like I echo everything that, that Vincent and Paul said, but yeah, that imposter syndrome is real and everyone goes through it. Um, but like Paul said, we're all just normal people and it's definitely a team effort in everything that we do here. Um, I would say other things that surprised me when I joined, uh, so joining Google Research, you know, I knew that we were kind of pushing the bounds here of what had been done before and exploring new fields and all of that, but I didn't really grasp what that would mean, uh, you know, at working there. And so what I found that that means is that there's no playbook. You're kind of creating things as you go. And that's really an amazing opportunity to, to learn, uh, to have a huge impact and to just be part of something that's kind of changing the world. So I found it uh, really inspiring and challenging in a good way. Awesome. Uh, David, how about you? Most surprising? All right, I agree with everything everyone has said. I'll also add, it surprised me so much how important your non-technical skills are at Google. Like even I work on a team where most people code most hours of the day. It's a very, very technical team, but 
your non-technical skills, your leadership, your influence, your communication, I would almost argue that stuff is more important than your technical skills. And, um, you know, I know for me and many other people, like I've never been a good programmer and I never will be, I'm just not smart enough, but I've been able to use my other skills to succeed. And, you know, even I mentioned I was a professional email spammer. Like I even have used those skills. Like I email spam, you know, the CEOs of a bunch of companies to, you know, to get, give me free stuff and free training and, you know, it has worked. And so if, if you're non-technical jumping into a technical, you know, industry, don't let, don't have that chip on your shoulder. Like, Hey, I, you know, I didn't get a BS in computer science. It's okay. You can contribute in other ways and arguably long-term you might even have better skills to succeed. So that net uh, delivering not only insights into Google, but also into how to get free stuff from CEOs of companies. So David gets, uh, yeah. you know, gets the superstar, uh, you know, gold star next to his, uh, pro tip and life hack. Well done. All right. Um, so, you know, a couple of things mentioned uh, throughout the panel on that last question, I wanted to maybe dive just a little bit deeper into these misperceptions, because I heard a couple of you start to refer to, you know, maybe thing people believe one thing, but the reality might be a little bit different. So you've experienced surprises. What do you think, you know, veteran community or allies, you know, what do you think might be some uh, misperceptions about working in tech uh, that new hires need to have, like some myths that need to be busted? Like right now, I've heard I've heard some for you in your role, but maybe more generally for veterans and for, uh, you know, give, give some coaching to the folks out there who are watching this week. Uh, let's add, and you know what, I'm going to turn it over to you, panel. Like you just start firing away. When you get passionate, you jump in. I see Paul. I see you. Yeah. So I, I would say from like from, in my experience. The technical stuff comes from what I'm passionate about. Like, if you're passionate about a subject, like it doesn't matter if you, you know, like, you, like I'm not, I'm not discounting a CS degree. Don't get me wrong. If I wish I kind of got a CS degree, but I, I also loved history, so I kind of like that the fact that I have a history degree. But what's been successful for me is getting passionate about a subject. Like, get a passion. Like for me, networking. That's my background. That's where I've worked at before I came to Google for the last 20 years. Like when I found out that you could go from my computer sitting on my desk. And, and get content, uh, you know, or look at stuff on it that was, you know, across the country, you know, you know, across the ocean, whatever, like that blew my mind. I got really passionate about like, how does that work, right? At a very early stage. And so just getting passionate about a subject, if you're passionate about something and you have that eagerness to learn, I think you'll do just fine. I mean, that, that's really what's been so successful for me is getting passionate about that subject. And then I just kind of Get obsessed with it and i just like you know absorb as much as i can and wherever i could you know volunteer got involved with other projects you know that's really what has been successful for me in my career one thing that paul just said about being passionate i, I remember will when when i started at google you know that was one of the first questions that some of the leadership team asked me when i was onboarding you know what 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 makes you passionate because you know we have all different topics and domains that we cover on my team, you know, between controls, uh, electrical infrastructure, mechanical, cooling, power, you know, operations, water treatment, you name it. So the thing is, we, we really try hard to make sure that people where they are passionate, we find a spot on our team so that they can contribute, you know, whether it's individually or as a leader, you know, to those areas, because like Paul's saying, if you're if you're passionate about what you do, you're you're not only willing to probably cover what's needed, but that's where we get people to kind of go beyond into the next steps and, and really achieve uh, some some great things. That's so true. Even uh, I've been asked that same question by my manager and other people and kind of that I work with, like, are you happy? Are you working on something that you're passionate about? That's really important here at Google. And it's it's evident in kind of just the culture here. So I've really enjoyed that part as well. Um, and I would say another thing that's a misconception that we've already touched on, but just that everyone has a CS degree or everyone is a software engineer. I definitely had that impression when I was coming in. And I, in fact, thought I would never get hired because I don't have that background. Um, but I think even in the hiring process, I was so impressed with, um, yes, I had technical interviews as a, as a TPM, but they took my background into account. They, you know, I don't have any software engineering experience, but I have data science experience and background. So they actually tailored my interviews to kind of look into my background and take into account me as a whole person and what I would bring to Google. So really impressed with that. And um, how Google kind of, they have, they want and have people of all kinds of backgrounds. Plus a hundred to all that. 
Um, I, you know, even though this is a career and it's a job and, you know, it's only part of our lives, like I strongly believe that, you know, you want to have no regrets when it comes to your career. You can look back and say like, you know what? I wasn't a professional email spammer for, you know, 40 years of my life. Um, I, I think one tough part about that, of you know, being passionate about something is a lot of times you don't know what you're passionate about or you don't even know, like, if your passion can really translate into a job. Um, so one thing I'd recommend for that is to try to expose yourself to as many different things as possible. Like go to meetups, you know, I guess virtual meetups these days, try to get involved in different you know, communities, try to go to tech events, uh, try to keep an open mind and, and dabble and explore. And, and I think eventually you'll find something. You know, it's really uh, standing out for me, listening to all of you describe the journey is just, uh, and maybe this was a misconception even I had uh, before I, you know, joined the, you know, kind of pure tech community and, and Google was that it, uh, there was like an archetype. And what's really cool to hear is, and what's represented on the panel here is, you know, a wide variety of backgrounds, job roles, job functions. And in every case, you know, the journey, uh, you could find yourself at Google, you know, in some form or fashion, whether it was in DC ops and customer engineering, Salesforce architect or uh, TPM. You know, there's a place for all of you here and, you know, just ex and being willing just to take the step and to go for it. And uh, sound, sounds like you've all, you know, had really interesting paths to get here. Uh, now, it's not, it's not necessarily always easy, I think would be a perception that and a reality that a lot of people have outside of Google to get to Google. And uh, it is, it is tough, right? Because this is a great team and we want great people, right? Um, and there are a lot of great people out there, veterans, allies, spouses, uh, this community. So I'd like you to kind of arm them a little bit, if you can, with some very specific skills, behaviors, or tactics that you used to land your role here at Google. I would say, first off, you know, I would recommend looking objectively, you know, at your background, at this, at the, not only the concrete hard skills, but then the soft skills and, you know, really be honest with yourself when you're looking at the postings, uh, whether it's at Google or at, at another company and trying to find, you know, the role that really is, you know, a best fit for your background and for what you can offer to that team. Because when you apply to those roles, I think you're, you're more likely to gain success there. And then, you know, one of the things we talk about here pretty routinely is I know, you know, when I had interviewed with other companies, sometimes people are always looking for, well, is this candidate a, a culture fit to our organization? And at Google, we, we, we really, at least on my team, talk a lot about not looking for a culture fit on our team. We really look for culture additions, you know, because if you only hire somebody that's a culture fit, you know, you really find yourself surrounding everyone with just another version of somebody that we already have on the team. And that doesn't always make our team stronger. So sometimes, you know, it's not about the fit, it's about the addition. So when you're looking for those roles, you know, you might want to think about what do you have to offer and and maybe look at the at the posting kind of as a, as a need. Think about those job postings as that's a problem that that company has. They need someone with those skills. And if you think that you can provide that addition to that team, then that might be the, the opportunity you want to go after. Yeah, I think... Like one of the things is, is just, you know, you can't control, I mean, there's just in, you know, there's really smart people and sometimes they're just genetically advanced, you know, from a, from that standpoint. So you can't really do anything about that. That doesn't always necessarily equate, like they're going to be the most successful. I'm a big believer in like, like I, I'll just outwork you. If I, if I'm not smarter than someone, then I'll just out outwork that person. I could, Cause I can control that. Like I can control how much effort I put into something. And so that's the way I, I kind of, you know, look at it, you know, like there's something I, I want to go after. Um, you know, I, I'm a reasonably smart person, but I can, I can work really hard. Right. And so that's the way I, I, I think that I got at Google. I took a, I took a you know, kind of like what Vincent said, right. Like take a look at like what you're good at, be realistic about that. And when you're going towards to highlight what you're good at, you know, cause not everyone's good at everything. So high, you're just going to be things you're, you're weak in. That's okay. Like that's just you know the reality of how big this subject is that we're all working in you know high tech right so you know really focus on um, you know highlighting what you're really good about and be comfortable with the fact that there's going to be certain things that they may ask you it comes up in the interview or stuff that you know you may not know 
that's okay. Like, don't get, don't let that throw you off and just continue to highlight what you're good at. I took a long term approach to get to Google one from a career standpoint, but two, you know, a couple of years ago, um, I knew that I wanted to get into the, into cloud. Right. And, and so I took a specific job at a startup that was a cloud management company, knowing that, okay, the startup will either blow up or it won't, and it'll set me up to be better positioned to be in, into a cloud job. And at the time, I was thinking more maybe AWS at the time, right? Because Google hadn't really hadn't come out with the cloud yet, you know, the, the, the strong cloud product. But I knew that going, going to this job would set me up, you know, for the cloud, for cloud, for what I wanted to be in, right? And so I took a long-term goal and kind of put a path for me to work my way into that, you know, into that. And, it, and, it, and luckily, it worked out for me. And I'm happy that it ended up being Google because I've always been a big fan of Google. Um, so I think having a plan, putting it in place, not worrying about, you know, being the best at everything, really um, focusing on what your strengths are and, and building a plan to get to where you want. Yeah, Paul, that really, that reminds me of something, you know, from my military days, which is uh, I didn't always have the answer, but I could go get the answer really quickly and I could figure out how to get that done. And I, and I think for those watching, you know, don't forget the skills that you have and that are embedded in you. I think sometimes the danger is, we feel like we have to have the answers. And, you know, like you described in the hiring process, that's absolutely, it's absolutely okay not to have the answer to all the questions that you're asked, but the thought process and how you would go about solving problems is absolutely critical uh, because we're interested in creative problem solving, bias to action, you know, action oriented folks. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things I, I personally experienced, you know, c coming to Google, even in my interview processes, I didn't have all the answers. Uh, but they, you know, gave me the time to explain how I would try to solve the problem. And that was, ended up being just as important, if not more important uh, than actually, you know, kind of faking it, uh, you know, which I think is a risk sometimes, right, to try to over-represent uh, what we know. All right, Erica, David, specific, get, I want some tactics. Like, let's, you know, how, how did you do it? How did you get here? Yeah, so I can, some tactical advice, let's see. So I would... Number one thing would say, reach out to your network, specifically your veteran network. Uh, so I did a lot of that because I just didn't have any idea how the tech industry worked. I didn't know what, what the job titles meant. I didn't know what kind of work they did, what skills were required. Uh, so by reaching out to a lot of times just other veterans that I didn't know, they weren't even former colleagues, but on LinkedIn or through friends of friends, uh, I just got invaluable advice on and information on kind of what a job title means, what work they really do day to day, what kind of uh, background would be required. And it wasn't, uh, Paul had mentioned kind of a long, long-term goal. Mine was not so long-term. I didn't, you know, have kind of a year long, many years long path that I was working towards getting to Google. I really just found a job at Google that fit my background that I already had. And I think that is, the, that's very possible because there are so many different roles at Google. So you don't have to have this, you know, you can find a job at Google that fits your background. And I think the best way to find those jobs, uh, you can search through the job listings, but really just reaching out to people and asking is so, so valuable. All right, I'll drop some of my secrets. I did a lot of shameless stuff. I'll say that right off the bat. First of all, I was rejected by Google 10 times in a row. And each of those 10 times, I thought I at least deserved, you know, a phone screen or something, but you know, nothing. And that taught me that I really needed to improve and do things differently. So on try number 11, I went all out. Like, like uh, I mentioned, I was an email spammer. I bought a list of all the Salesforce managers at Google and I email spammed them. I, I basically, you know, essentially begged them for a job and, and you know, had my, uh, had my resume with it. Uh, Highway 101, it's got a bunch of billboards, drives right through Google, costs $6,000 to buy a, one of those billboards on that. Fortunately, I got a phone screen before I had to pull the trigger on that. But that was that was on the table. You know, I, I, I got referrals from my friends. I Before the interview, I memorized everything about everyone who was interviewing me. Like, I knew Jackson loves soccer, and he loves Manchester United, and his favorite player, you know, at the time was Ronaldo or something like that. I know this guy likes to gamble. You know, I know this guy, I, I memorized everything about everyone. I went all in on that. And, uh, you know, all this stuff with a combination of all, a lot of other stuff and a lot of failure basically taught me how to do it. And so 
I'd say persistence, uh, thinking outside the box, and um, and and being honest with yourself about you know how you can improve. Awesome. So maybe Thanks. just to tamper that, I would say uh, extreme measures should not be required to get a job here. Just bring yourself, your whole self, to the interview, and your experience that you bring from the military is is really valuable, and you already have a lot of skills. So. Yeah. yeah, that uh, uh, well said, Erica and David. Uh, grit and persistence uh, certainly uh, helpful attributes, you know, to land in tech and at Google. Uh, but this VetNet panel does not necessarily endorse uh, buying uh, billboards on Highway 101. Uh, and there are many more resources available to you at the VetNet, uh, you know, Career Week, uh, which we'll make available, which hopefully will offload your need to uh, purchase billboards. Uh, but I, I love the grit and determination. And especially, you know, doing the homework and thinking about the role and thinking about what you're actually asking for and, you know, what you're, where you're going to interview and the people that will be there. Because it is a very, I think one of the common themes so far we've heard also in this panel is it's a very human endeavor. In a technology company, you know, sometimes we can gravitate to the tech and we can gravitate to the computers. Uh, but in the end, it is a human endeavor. So uh, thank you for all that. And kind of pulling on a thread that... Uh, you mentioned earlier in, uh, it was it was mentioned as an aside, but I actually think it's so critical. I want to call it out here and have you all dive into it a little bit, which is imposter syndrome. Something I had certainly felt, uh, and I felt on the way into Google. Candidly, I think I still feel it from time to time. I know I still feel it from time to time uh, in my role, just because of the caliber of my teammates and the job, I, great job I want to do for all of them. So there are many veterans and spouses and and allies and others who may you know want to find their way to Google. Um, but maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome might be holding them back or maybe adding a little bit of anxiety. Um, what are your go-to strategies for dealing with imposter syndrome and this very real phenomenon? I would say, you know, just go back to kind of the reason why the event happened that got you there. You know, if you're, if, if we talked about how thorough and sometimes lengthy the hiring process is, if it's your first day on the job, you know, realize that you were vetted by a number of phone screeners, a number of in-person interviewers by a hiring manager and hiring committee. And every one of those experienced Googlers, you know, thought that you have something to bring to this team. So even if it's your first day on the job, following orientation, you have something that you can contribute and kind of maybe write that, write that down somewhere. You know, I, I'm here for a reason. They brought me into this team. I have skills, I have a background and I have the ability to contribute and lead in numerous ways and kind of just remember that that's what got you here. Cause it can seem daunting as soon as you, as soon as you on board, you know, there's an, an immediate mountain of things, you know, for you to learn, for you to climb, for you to, for you to, for you to start running off and doing, but kind of maybe just stepping back every now and then remembering, you know, I, I was brought here for a reason. I was put in this position for a reason and and I certainly can do this. And the fact that there, there's people out there to help that if you are feeling like you're struggling with a, a way to get started, you know, we have a, a very big network around both uh, the United States and globally to, to help you get started in a direction that you might feel like you're struggling. Yeah. For, for me, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I think, well, two, two points. I mean, self, self-doubt in general, right, is always going to be something we have. Um, you know, I've always been a pretty confident person. I think probably um, Google is probably one of the only jobs I've ever had where on day one I was, you know, I had this imposter. So you're always nervous when you start a new job, but like the imposter syndrome was, you know, Google was probably the only place I've actually had that. And, like, and I think that the, um, the nice thing about it is, is you know, look, you're going to have that it's the the thing that helped me the best was just acknowledgement. Like my first day, like during, during the, um, the, you know, you got the Noogler um, uh, orientation, like the, you know, one of the, within the, one of the first sessions, it was addressed like, Hey, look, we know you all feel this way. We all did. Like just, just having that verbalized, that just took the weight off my shoulder. Like, Oh, okay. I'm not the only one here. You know, and my Noogler class was 400 something people in our orientation day. And I think like, you know, when that was said, you could see, you know, a couple hundred people just like visibly relax a little bit and be like, oh, okay, like that's where it goes back to like, hey, we're all just humans here. Google's aware that there's this imposter syndrome. You know, it's 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 verbalized. You know, you talk to other people, they say it. And just, you know, after a little while, you just realize, okay, everyone kind of, you know, I'm not alone here. Other people have it. So I'm not weird for having this, you know, and it and it's just so it really helps it. It's it's verbalized not only from your coworkers, but from the institution, Google itself. 
saying, hey, look, we know you're going to have this. You're here for a reason. Feel confident in that. And that, that really kind of helped me get over that pretty quickly. I yeah, wholeheartedly agree with everything Paul said. That's I think the more that we talk about it and uh, and kind of discuss it with other people, it just you kind of acknowledge that feeling and you're like, hey, I'm not weird. Other people feel this way too. In fact, most people feel this way, um, and it just becomes something that you don't have to let take over and you know be afraid of. And I think I mean I felt the same way going into flight school. Am I going to be a good pilot? Can I really do this? I think at every stage of people's careers and lives, they feel that way at some point. Um, so the more that we acknowledge it and talk about it, and Google does a great job of that with with Nooglers and just throughout the teams, and you know, people talk about this regularly. So that makes a huge difference. And I think we can show we can be the leaders to to make this better by just talking about it ourselves, saying, "Hey, I have imposter syndrome," and that makes everyone else feel more open to talk about it as well. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same way too. You know, I'm I'm still waiting for, you know, HR or my manager just to like tap me on the shoulder and be like, you know what, it was a mistake hiring you. We made a mistake. I'm sorry. You got to go. Like, I, I I still feel that way even you know after eight years at Google. Um, one thing that has helped me, and I felt imposter syndrome, especially when it comes to coding, just because I'm like a self-taught person, no degree. And one thing that really helped was actually getting uh, certifications in that just to have that kind of like objective, you know, global standard and being able to meet that eventually, uh, that made me, you know, have some settlement in my heart being like, okay, maybe, maybe I can code, you know, decently. Uh, so David, I want to, I want to pull on that thread a little bit because certifications, knowledge, expertise gained can also be an accelerant into roles at Google. So, you know, David, I'd love to hear, you know, if, if you've got any more to share from the panel, um, what resources are kind of like your go-to resources for you know continuing to you know enhance your skill set and or were there any that you utilized before coming uh, to Google? Yeah, for sure. Certifications was a big one. I remember before I applied to Google, I didn't mention this earlier, but I I basically got like every certification possible. I'm like I don't know seven to ten of them. I just studied back to back and just kept working hard towards it. That was a really big one, especially in the Salesforce industry. I'd recommend that. Um, another big resource that's also specific to the Salesforce industry is um, is is lean into the uh, Salesforce veteran community. Uh, Salesforce. I'm wearing their T-shirt. Vetforce. They've rebranded to Salesforce Military. They give you free training. They teach you Salesforce coding, non-coding. They help you get certified as well, and then they help you land a role in the industry. Uh, all this is for free. There's other programs like Mervis. It's a community-run one, and um, yeah, I think I think for veterans, especially in the Salesforce world, if you want to get in tech, Salesforce is perfect. We love veterans in general. At Dreamforce, the biggest software conference, there's 200,000 people there live every year. At the keynote, right next to the CEO, there's a whole section they reserve just for veterans. Literally sitting next to you know the highest level people at Salesforce. Salesforce is, is big fans and uh, it's, it's a good place to go if you want to get in this industry. The data center operations group, you know, there's certifications, things like electrical licensing that each of the state runs, you know, slightly differently. There's environmental protection type of licensing for doing certain types of mechanical work. Uh, there's certainly great things to get. Uh, the posting may not specifically require an individual to have, you know, either or both of those types of certifications. But if it's something that somebody has gone out and done, it certainly help will help them. And internally to Google, we we outsource ourselves to some certifications, especially when it comes to things like safety. We're very safety oriented in, in the way we run our day-to-day -day jobs. So we don't we don't try and kind of teach ourselves some of those things. So we certify ourselves for some of our, our high voltage electrical safety things through some of the, the industry leaders that we know are the experts and we kind of outsource to them in order to keep ourselves certified to uh, keep both ourselves and the rest of our team safe. And I think I just add that uh, there isn't necessarily, there is no like you have to have this certificate or you have to have a degree in this or a degree at all. There's all kinds of backgrounds here, like we've all said before. And I think, uh, first of all, just pursuing what you're passionate about, like has been said here too, however works best for you. So if that's an online course, if that's a master's, if that's a PhD, whatever you're interested in and passionate about, 
pursue it in the way that works for you in your life. Uh, and then if you have questions about what what real requirements would would I need to to meet to apply to this particular role at Google, uh, there's resources that that we've mentioned and that will be mentioned on the site that will help you figure that out so that you can be really clear about what you really need to do or what you can kind of choose to do because you're passionate about it. Yeah, I would say um, there's almost like I didn't even even when I was go interviewing um, now two and a, two and a half almost three years later. Like I, there's so many more resources that I even know about. There's just an enormous amount of resources available to you to, you know, to come to GCP or tech in general. Or oh, sorry, I keep saying GCP to Google. I work in GCP. Google Cloud, but in particular, is um, is there's an advantage to that, right? Everything we sell, everything that we're we're dealing with in Google Cloud is available as a product. So it's not like, you know, like Vincent, you like you can't just walk into the data center and, and really know how, you know, Google, you know, data center. You, you know, everything I, everything I, from a Google Cloud standpoint that you're going to be dealing with is publicly accessible and you get a $300 credit when you sign it up and you can go, you know, go use those products, go through the, there's all kinds of documentation. There's, there's labs that you can do. And I, I made an investment in mine. So not only did I do burn through 300 credits, but then, you know, I put it on my own credit card and, you know, was able to kind of use those products to get used to and prepare myself to get at Google. But there's all kinds of resources. VetNet, we've all talked about. There's all types of different clubs. There's all kinds of different, you know, things that Google is doing to engage with people to help them prepare for careers at Google, whatever it may be. There's so many resources um, um, that is available if uh, people just look for it. I mean, it's, it's amazing now that being part of Google, the, how many resources we make available to help people um, who maybe have nothing to do with technology to get them involved in tech to, you know, to going to, you know, tech campuses and recruiting really high tech people to going to, like I said, non-tech people and helping them with resources for these types of jobs, whether they be technology jobs or there's hundreds, there's all kinds of jobs at Google that aren't technical, right? Like we're a normal company. There's lots of, you know, technology is what we are as a company, but that doesn't run Google. Like there's a lot of careers at Google that are super important to make sure that we're successful that you that you may be doing already in your current job and there's there's a rec open you know at Google, right? So just I think just look into it. All right. So I'm gonna flip the script here. I've been asking a lot of questions, but I'm interested in the number one. So who here on the panel has uh, has like helped or mentored someone in the veteran community, ally community with questions about Google? Like show of hands. Who, who on the panel? So okay, so everybody. All right, great. So uh whew. All right, so uh, with that cleared out of the way, uh, what may be the most frequent question that you get from people that you're trying to help uh, you know, make their way to Google or tech generally and uh, the advice that you give them? So uh, Erica, sorry to put you on the hot seat, but uh, what do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the biggest thing that I hear is uh, I'm interested in in big tech companies or Google specifically, but I have no idea if my background meets what Google would want or what where to even start, where to look, what I would need to do to, to get a job at Google. And so uh, what I tend to do when, when I'm helping former colleagues from the Navy or uh, friends of mine is just take some time to talk to them and look at their what they've done in the military, um, see how that could translate and help them start to make those connections. It's really a game of translation because you've done things in the military that that are super relevant to some part of what we do at Google. You just may not know it yet. Awesome. I, I think that's the question that, uh, you know, that I get as well, right? Like, I'll get a question like, you know, I don't, how do I get into this field or how do I get, how do I go from the military, right? I did this in the military. Um, how do I, how do I, how do I get from there into like high tech, like a hot industry or whatever? That's what I'm interested in. And you know, depending on their their you know skill levels, they may already be programmers. You know, and want to get into software engineering, may not have that. I, I I say, look, if you're interested in something, find some way to get involved somewhere, right? So if you're not a programmer, can you read and write? Great, volunteer in open source project to help write documentation, like. Uh, right, because a lot of this, we're all still humans. Connections. We talked about networking. I'm not talking about I TCP IP. I'm talking about personal relationships with people. If you volunteer in a project, an open source project, and you start doing documentation, you can get 
connected into people. You can start learning how to program. Like it's all part of the process, right? So there's ways to get involved at the bottom level where you can work your way up. Um, and that's a great way to get involved in something like start, you know, look at some open source project, volunteer to do documentation, volunteer to do something. Um, I've seen lots of people, that's the way they started their career out. And a lot of, um, so just, they're just be creative. And like I said, you don't have to be the smartest. You can always outwork everyone. One of the questions I get often from some of the the veterans that I know that, you know, are trying to leave the service and look for, look for jobs, or there is a perception sometimes that you can't get a job at Google unless you kind of get out of the military and go get a similar role, like at another company, and then kind of like Google only hires folks from those other in, and we certainly do that. There's certainly plenty of folks on my team that came from other data center industry type companies that had industry experience, but there's equally as many folks that came, you know, right out of the military. We have folks from Army Prime Power to Air Force Facility, Marine Corps Aviation, Navy Shipboard Engineering. You know, we kind of have a lot of a lot of variety of folks, and some of them did get out of the service and go to other companies, and then plenty of them also came directly from the service to to Google. So that would be my big, you know, misconception that I've heard is that you have to kind of go get other industry experience after the military before you can come to a company like Google. Although plenty of people do that, uh, it's certainly not required. Um, maybe the most common question I get is like, it's my dream to work at Google specifically. Like, how can I eventually do that? And I, I feel like the good news is, I believe anyone can get into Google. I sincerely believe that the bottom of my heart and it might not happen tomorrow. But, you know, with the proper planning and persistence, like Paul mentioned, and, you know, anyone can do it. And so if my son, for example, came up to me, he's like, okay, I want to get into Google, like, like, all right, let's make a long term plan, you know, think about the, your full package, is your experience there? Right? Do you have the knowledge? Is your does your resume need a makeover? Does, is your resume truly, you know, top 5% of all random resumes in the world? And, you know, can you practice interviewing as well? Um, and just thinking, you know, it's, I was rejected 10 times. It took me over five years to get into Google. And so all that preparation over time, and it was my dream to get into Google. Uh, it just prepared a lot on every possible aspect there over time. I failed a lot. I improved each time. And, um, you know, eventually you can do it if you, if you set your mind to it. Yeah, I uh, worked on a lot of workshops uh, since coming to Google uh, roughly seven years ago. And uh, I can tell you that you know, it's, it's kind of like an encapsulation of all of these things that you were describing. It's just like getting started knowing uh, the number one question I get is, is how do I make it to Google specifically? And it, and it usually starts with some self-reflection, you know, some guided self-reflection on, on both our parts, both, you know, for the person that's asking, what is it that they really want? Kind of back to the passion and the journey, you know, because I think sometimes the the question about Google is actually the wrong question. The question is, what do you want to do? And then I can be most useful for guiding them into like the translation device of what does that mean at Google? When you say this, what are the terms or the words that we use? Um, and so quite often, you know, that question, is, it's definitely the most frequent question I get. And then we turn it into a conversation about uh, passion and interest because there are so many paths and there are so many resources, but it's really hard to focus them when we can't agree on what that focal mechanism or that focal point is. All right, so esteemed panelists, uh, in, in deference to, to all the, you know, the Navy uh, folks here today, I'm gonna remove my cap, uh, you know, uh, salute you, but you have one more task. And this task is, all right, for all the veterans, spouses and allies out there, I would like you to take the best advice you have received on your journey. And I'd like you to share it with the audience today. So I'll give you a second, because I know this is a, you know, it's a deep philosophical question here at the end of the panel. And I'll let you choose who wants to lead off. Sure, well, so the, the best advice I, I received was, you know, to never make too many assumptions and to never stop learning. So, you know, every day, you know, we have to use data and information that's present to, to make decisions without making, you know, an excessive number of assumptions and then just never stop learning because the, the industry as a whole is changing very rapidly. There's new products, new procedures, new new policies that kind of come out on a, on a regular basis. And as soon as you stop kind of keeping up with them, you know, you become stagnant and it'll certainly hinder, you know, yourself 
from uh, achieving some of the things that you need to do. I'd say the, the best advice, the most, the one that influenced my career the most was like how to write a good email. Honestly, it was like, keep it short. Don't make it too long. Add bullet points and use bold, you know, uh, for the important stuff that, that has really transformed, you know, my career a lot. Um, another one I think about a lot, um, is you either pass or you learn. So, you know, you, you just got to go for it and don't be afraid of failure because you will learn something and you will improve in time. And if you play the long game, you will find success. Yeah, super relevant, you know, through all phases of the exploration, right? Because if you don't take the chance and if you don't uh, make the inquiry, don't do the homework, you never actually get the chance to do the interview and uh, to land here. That's certainly something we've seen, you know, systemically at Google and as a hiring manager for, you know, probably thousands of people, both on my team and others at this point, uh, you know, just that willingness to step forward uh, sometimes is, is the kind of the nudge that gets everything else going. And, uh, you know, a lot of advice shared today on ways to, you know, get that confidence uh, boosted and go after it. So uh, thanks for sharing that particular one, David. I'll, I'll go next. Erica, you got yours? <laughs> sure. It was a standoff. <laughs> so um, I'd say as you're, if you're transitioning out of the military, take some time to explore what interests you because it's hard to know. I think probably most of us went through this. It's hard to know what is even out there when you're leaving. And uh, a lot of times you end up just copying what other people do and without really exploring all the options that are out there. Um, so take some time and reach out to your network and just read and talk to people and learn about what different uh, careers and fields are out there. Um, and then if I can add another one, I would say, uh, like some other people have said here, don't be afraid of failure because failure is just part of the process. Um, don't close doors on yourself just because you may get rejected. Uh, even like David's was very open about his experience and I've been rejected when I've applied to jobs too that weren't Google. And uh, that's, it's normal. It doesn't, it's not even a reflection on you. It's a reflection of timing of what the company is looking for at that particular moment. It's not, it's rarely about you. Uh, so just don't close those doors on yourself. Don't be afraid to to try for what you're really interested in. Um, so, so for me, it's it's kind of a combination of a lot of stuff I've already kind of talked about, right? Like for me, I I think early on um, I got advice about um, I'd get really kind of spun up or wound up about things that I had no control over. I couldn't really. It just you know, like my big thing is work hard and focus your time on things you can where you can make impact or you can control. Some things in life you can't control. It's going to rain on Thursday and you can't, you know, it's, it's going to rain. Like don't get worked up about it. Right. But you can get ready for the rain. So my point is, is, you know, especially in big companies, you know, cause Google is a big company now, but that's, that's my big thing is I, I, I try to work really hard and I try to focus my time on where I can make impact or don't get too caught up in things that I can't change and work where I can make impact and what I can change. And that's why I put my, my focus and my mentality. Awesome. Well, amazing insights, advice, candor, perspective, journeys, people. Um, I'm fired up just being a part of this panel today. So I know that people out there watching are going to be fired up. So I can't say thank you enough. But unfortunately, we're running out of time. So uh, I'll have to say thank you to Erica, Paul, Vincent, and David for the wonderful stories and extremely helpful information. Uh, as I said, I've learned a lot and I know everyone out there has as well. Uh, thanks again for participating on this panel and to our viewers. If you're interested in learning more about Google, and I bet you are after this conversation, uh, we have roles, we have opportunities. Uh, we'd like you to head on over uh, to review our career readiness materials. Uh, you can check out the resources tab on the Google VetNet Career Week landing page. And following this, we'll move into our industry panel starting at 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. You can join the live stream to hear about the tech industry from panelists at Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Salesforce, LinkedIn, and Citrix. Uh, and if you're more interested in the consumer packaged goods, retail industry, or the healthcare and life sciences industry, uh, you can view those panels on our career week landing page. All six of our functional panels will be recorded for you to view later at go.co forward slash vets if you missed any. 
thanks again for watching and a final thank you to this uh, awesome panel. I'm fired up and uh, we hope to see you here at Google soon. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Yep, thanks, Will. Yep.